It is therefore time for question period. The member from Huron Group. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, either the Minister of Environment and Climate Change is unable to manage his own staff or he instructs them to circumvent existing rules. According to Global News, there is confirmation that between 2006 and 2014, his ministry chose to ignore thousands of noise and health complaints against industrial wind turbines. Hey. Just this past April, <clears throat> excuse me, the minister shared how proud he is of his staff. But, Speaker, this is not a record to be proud of. Out of thousands of complaints, more than two-thirds were ignored. Speaker, will the Premier instruct this minister to do his job and investigate all of the complaints that he is receiving Question. on industrial wind turbines from every corner of this province, especially Thank those you. related to total Thank noise. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I know that the Minister of the Environment will want to, uh, to comment, but I also know, Mr. Speaker, that um, we take concerns from community members very, very seriously on uh, a full range of issues, including, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've spent, I've spent uh, uh, an enormous amount of time uh, over the years listening to and talking to people who are concerned about wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, when I became the Premier, we changed the rules, Mr. Speaker, about municipal input and the siting of uh, wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. I'm reading the signals, and I'm prepared to do that. Premier. I know that the member opposite knows, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, under the current Answer. rules, that municipalities have much more uh, authority to uh, to indicate whether they are willing hosts or not, Mr. Speaker. The, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, will come to order. Supplementary. The member from London, Middlesex. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, this government is forcing municipalities of, like Dutton Dunwich to accept some of the province's largest it's turbines, true. and the planned project in Dutton uh, is the Strong Breeze Wind Project. They're forcing them, even though a poll conducted by the municipality showed that 84 percent of residents strongly opposed the project, as did the municipality. Now we're hearing the Ministry of Environment Climate Change has ignored thousands of noise complaints. Not only are the residents forced to accept wind turbines, they must now know that the ministry will not help them and ignore all the problems caused by wind turbines. Speaker, this government has already admitted they do not need energy that will be created by the Strong Breeze Project in Dun Dunwich. Will the Premier do the right thing? Listen to the municipalities who say no and cancel the Strong Question. Breeze Wind Project in Dutton Dunwich. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment you, uh, and Climate Mr. Change. Speaker, first of all, I was not the minister in that period of time. Second of all, no, I, I mean, really. First off. Member from Leeds Grenville. <laughs> Carry on, Minister. Mr. Speaker, not only we take these seriously, and in the, in the three years since I've been minister, and I assume in the period before, I have met with numerous people. We're working with the member from Huron Bruce on the K2 project. There is extensive testing going on. We are including and adding tonal testing, which is very important. We are expanding our road. I've talked to the folks in the community. They are very concerned. We are working with them. We are not ignoring these things, but it's passing curious to me, Mr. Speaker. They never raise issues about nuclear waste. They never raise issues about coal pollution, about challenges of electric tra transmission lines. They only attack renewable green energy, Mr. Speaker. They have a similar obsession. With, with with anything that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, this is the party that. Thank you. That, uh, Thank you. Final supplementary: the member from Halliburton, Fourth and Lake Sprock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. On Global News, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change claimed that industrial wind turbine noise complaints are isolated to one project up in Huron Bruce, but these concerns are not isolated. 
The proposal for Snowy Ridge, in a project in my riding, was reviewed by a former MOECC employee who pointed out flaws in the project. The employee's assessment was redacted from the appeal process. Shame. Two expert noise witness statements were redacted. The concern of three residents were redacted. Yet the minister, and he was the minister at the time, claimed that there were no expert witnesses to support health concerns. Absolutely shame. The minister claims to take this issue seriously, but how can the minister explained this blatant scheme to redact information and hide the facts your employees are even telling you. you. So, Mr. Speaker, Minister, member from Leeds Grenville, second time, and we'll discuss warnings later. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite, whose leader spent years in Ottawa denying climate change, actively undermining the efforts of Quebec, Ontario, attacking carbon prices. It starts up again. I'll go to warnings to those banging their desks to prevent answers. Minister, finish, please. So. The party opposite made the claim for a better part of 10 years that wind turbines cause health problems. This government spent a considerable amount of money hiding the leading experts and did medical research, as did the federal government, and found out Answer. that the totality of the opposition party's claims were completely bogus and, like so much, not science-based. The creationist party, the climate Thank denial you. party, doesn't like New question. The member from dufferin Keller. Back to the Premier. It's no surprise to me to learn from Global that the minister has failed to investigate noise and health complaints related to industrial wind turbines. Liberal ministers have been ignoring homeowners in Dufferin Caledon for over 10 years. In 2011, I asked the Minister of Environment to help the Whitworth family when their doctor recommended they leave their home because of noise and electrical pollution. In 2013, the Whitworths received a one-sentence email from the Minister of Environment that said, and I quote, the ministry has closed your file at this time, and the minister will not be taking any action on your complaints. Will the premier do the right thing and reopen the Whitworth file? Mr. Speaker, as I said uh, in answer to the, the first question, I am and have been very concerned about the, uh, the community reaction to the siting of wind turbines. I met with many groups over a period of years, Mr. Speaker. I sat with them. I listened to their concerns. I made sure, I made sure that— The member for Dufferin Caledon come to order. I made sure that we uh, had studies in place, Mr. Speaker. I made sure that we worked with the federal government as the Health Canada studies were done, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we made changes. We made changes in terms of citing. <coughs> Member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. Carry on. Changes in terms of the siting of, uh, of wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. We gave more responsibility and more authority to municipalities. So we That's have right. made changes, Mr. Speaker, based exactly on the concerns that the uh, members opposite are raising. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, to the Premier. Her minister is either willfully uninformed of the number of complaints about wind turbine no noise filed with his department or deliberately ne ne neglectful of his duty. One of my constituents complained about how measurements were improperly conducted in the nationwide rise wind project. And now I know for a fact that the minister's own account and his constituency office were cc'd in the complaint. He says there were only one complaint. But on reported, as reported on Global News, there were thousands. People across Ontario deserve answers and a resolution to the complaint. This government recently stated that because of the surplus of power, they were cancelling the next round of energy projects. Will the Premier do the honourable thing and order her minister to put an immediate stop to all wind turbine developments in, until the massive backlog of complaints can be addressed? Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, have, we have worked to respond to concerns. We have responded to concerns from the municipalities. Mr. Speaker, I take, these, I take these concerns very seriously, and we have worked to address them, and we will continue to work with the— The member from dufferin Caledon is warned. Premier. 
But, Mr. Speaker, I have to ask the question, is it not that this party does not want to talk about the reality that we are making changes in this province that they are labelling as too much, too soon, Mr. Speaker, because they are going to help people, the changes that we are making, as in the uh, development of green renewable energy helps, from here on Bruce. helps kids with asthma, Mr. Speaker, cleans up the air. Remember this party doesn't Hastings. want to talk about a $15, minimum, $15 minimum wage. This party doesn't want to talk about $100,000 in child care spaces, Mr. Speaker. They're leaving. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. You see it, please? You see it, please? And the, mem the member from Nepean Carleton will come to order. Next time I have to stand for this kind of thing, we'll go to warnings. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I got it right. The member from Niagara West, Clanbrook. <laughs> Speaker, it's past time that the Premier paid attention. Hydro bills have skyrocketed by over 300 per cent. Expensive and counterproductive power subsidies for turbines we don't want or need have contributed to the soaring energy prices that yep. are the greatest burden people are facing. Yet this government has ignored the thousands of complaints they've received. This Liberal government has not paid attention to the many petitions MPPs have presented regarding this issue, nor have they paid attention to their Shameful. own communities. Some of the 90 unwilling communities are in several of their ridings as well. Just a few weeks so ago, this government had the opportunity to reverse their folly when my motion for a moratorium came forward. Yep. Respect for local decision-making was at hand, but they voted it down. Mr. Speaker, why question. does the Premier continue to ignore and dismiss everyone's concern? Good question. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's absolutely not the case. Uh, you know, I have met with folks in, the, in that member's own riding of Binbrook, Mr. Speaker, and, and have heard their— Member from here on Bruce, second time, and the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. I've got a good memory. Carry on. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, I believe that this party really does not want to talk about the concerns of people who believe that having a fair workplace, having a $15 minimum wage is important. Their leader has made it clear that he thinks that is too much too soon. But I would ask, Mr. Speaker, is it too much too soon for the 30 per cent of Ontarians right now who make less than $15 an hour? Is it too much too soon for part-time workers to get paid the same as full-time workers? Your time is up, Premier. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. The Premier has shown Ontarians time and time again throughout this session that she simply doesn't get what they're going through. Families are at a tipping point when it comes to things like keeping up with their skyrocketing hydro bills. But instead of helping, the Premier has put herself and her party first by ramming through a borrowing scheme that she knows will cause bills to soar even higher than they are now. When will the Premier apologize Member to Ontarians for putting her political agenda ahead of the very real struggles of the people of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, my plan, our plan for the people of Ontario, is to invest in this province, to grow the economy, to work with business, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that young people have access to education, an excellent education from preschool right through to uh, post-secondary, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that families have access to childcare, to make sure that kids have access to the medication that they need and their families can afford to look after them, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that kids have access to all of the services that they need and families have the support they need, including, including a reduction in their electricity prices, Mr. Speaker, a reduction that will happen this summer, not in the distant future, if a federal government should deign to agree with them as the NDP plan would have, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is to make sure that people have the resources that they need to take and that they are able to take part in the economic growth of this province, Mr. Speaker. Answer. That's what our fair workplace plan is about. That's what our fair hydro plan is about. That's what our fair housing plan is about. And <coughs> Thank you.
As promised, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. We're now in warnings. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. The Premier is focused on bringing up her dismal poll numbers. This became obvious when, even after the financial accountability officer confirmed that her hydro borrowing scheme would mean higher, not lower, bills for families and businesses, she rammed it through the House anyway. This plan is not good for everyday Ontarians. It is good for those at the top, though. Why is the Premier more concerned about her wealthy Bay Street friends than she is about the people who voted for her? Minister of Housing is warned. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's the last day in the legislature before we go on uh, onto the uh, the summer portion of our. I'm not going to say break because I know that uh, everyone in this legislature is going to be working very hard once the house rises. But because it's the last day, Mr. Speaker, I really have to say this. I know that the opposition parties believe that by making a personal attack and ra ra raising the issue of my personal polling numbers, that somehow that's going to get under my skin and that's a good political tactic. Here's the newsflash, Mr. Speaker. I know what the polls say. I understand that, and I am absolutely focused on doing what's in the best interest of the people of this province today and every day through the election, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You say that, please. <clears throat> Order. Feel free to continue to insult the chair and be disrespectful. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. That was strangely Nixonian, I have to say, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, families and businesses have been telling the Premier for years now that they can't afford more hydro rate hikes. Yet she has pushed ahead with the sell-off of Hydro One and her borrowing scheme, both of which will, will drive up hydro rates. Why is the Premier ignoring what Ontarians are telling her? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Let's talk about what happened in the House yesterday, Mr. Speaker. We voted in a plan that's actually going to reduce everyone's rates by 25 percent on average. They voted against that, Mr. Speaker. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Bungary, is warned. I may move to name you. This is getting ridiculous. The disrespect you're showing the chair and to each other. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to making sure that you have in place a program to help the most vulnerable in this province, when it comes to lowering rates, Mr. Speaker, both opposition parties voted against it, Mr. Speaker. First Nations, First Nations on reserve individuals who many live in abject poverty, Mr. Speaker, we're reducing their rates. Yes, sir. One of the things that they did, Mr. Speaker, they voted against it. Thank we you. made sure with our plan that we're helping every single family in this Thank province. You. That's something they continue to vote against. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Mr. President, my question is for the Premier. Well, it's not just our electricity system that the Premier's Liberal government has made worse. After years of frozen hospital budget and cut to frontline health care staff, the Premier 2017 budget shortchanges hospitals again, this time by about $300 million shortchange. 
Why is the Premier so intent on keeping our hospital chronically underfunded? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think that um, the uh, member opposite knows that there is a, uh, in our 2017 budget, a 3.1% increase to uh, to those hospital budgets, those operating budgets across the board, Mr. Speaker, and uh, uh, at least a 2% increase for every hospital in the province, Mr. Speaker. On top of that, there's, I think, it's nine billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, that will be available for uh, for construction and capital uh, capital costs, Mr. Speaker. So we absolutely recognize the critical work that is done by hospitals. We also recognize that there was a need on top of the more than $450 million that we put in-year funding uh, onto hospital-based funding last year, Mr. Speaker, that there needed to be an increase to hospital operations. We put that in the budget in recognition of those concerns, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, budget freezes and cut to frontline staff leads to overcrowding. It leads to poor quality care. It leads to hallway medicine. Hospitals like the one in Thunder Bay or in Sault Ste. Marie are in constant state of gridlock. We've seen occupancy rate of 120% in acute care units and people receiving treatments in hallways, TV room, shower room, storage area, patient lounge, and the list goes on. The premier constant cuts to health care is hurting people, the very people she is supposed to help. Why does the pre Premier refuse to properly fund our hospitals? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, um, you know, when we provide a 5% increase to the operating budget of the Sioux Hospital that you just referenced this year, uh, $6 million, more than $6 million, when uh, Health Sciences North and Sudbury uh, received an additional $6 million as well this fiscal year uh, in a budget that provides more than half a billion new dollars to our hospitals to help them address those issues that are most pressing to them. And Mr. Speaker, it boggles my mind when the member opposite would argue so vehemently in support of increasing hospital budgets, yet she would vote against a budget that does exactly that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have a long list of hospitals that I'm happy to go through which received this year Thank you. substantial increases in funding. Yeah. Final supplementary. What does hospital underfunding look like? Well, let me tell you about Henri Chartrand from my writing. What does his stay at HSN look like? His first two days was on a stretcher in ER. Then he was moved to a TV room. What he told me was that it was humiliating, embarrassing, and a demeaning experience that he never wants to have to go through again. Unfortunately, Mr. Chartrand is just one of literally hundreds of people from across the province that have suffered the same indignity because of our hospital overcrowding, because of underfunding by this government. When will the Premier stop the cuts and finally invest in people's health and dignity? Thank you. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, we just did last week in a budget that that member voted against and her party voted against. Mr. 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 Speaker, I know that I think perhaps she's imagining what an NDP government would look like. She might be imagining 1994 when the NDP announced a $53 million cut to 10 of Ontario's psychiatric hospitals, representing 17 percent, a 17 percent cut in those hospitals. Or, Mr. Speaker, she might be remembering the last time that they were in government when they delisted 10 percent of all the drugs that were provided to Ontarians. By the way, more drugs were delisted by that government than in their meager proposal to add 125 essential drugs in their so-called pharmacare plan, Mr. Speaker. They closed 24 percent of the acute hospital beds in the province. They closed, as I mentioned, 7, 13 percent of the mental Answer. health beds, and they reduced hospital funding in their last year, thankfully their last year as government. Thank you. 
Your question, the member from Renfrew, Mr. St. Kemba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. It is Injured Workers' Day. This past January, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board made significant changes to its hearing aid program without properly consulting audiologists and WSIB recipients. They have now handpicked only three suppliers. As a result of these changes, workers across the province now have fewer options, which is negatively impacting their quality of life. Speaker, as a result of on-the-job hearing loss, tens of thousands of workers now require hearing devices in order to maintain a baseline quality of life. The new system does not save money, but outcomes for our WSIB re recipients are much worse. How can the minister defend a policy change where no one benefits? Speaker, thank you very much to the honourable member for what is a very, very important question and one that I turn my attention to because of the same concerns that were being addressed. Speaker, at the Ministry of Labour, the WSIB, we're committed to making sure we treat injured workers with the dignity, the respect, and the services that they need and they deserve. Speaker, we all know how important it is that Ontario workers who work with, uh, who are dealing with the challenges of work-related hearing loss received the highest quality services and the highest quality equipment, Speaker. I was made aware of some of the concerns that injured workers and the audiologists themselves, Speaker, uh, have with some of the uh, uh, recent changes. I've personally been in touch with the WSIB on this issue, and I'm confident that we can find a way to work our way through this with the new changes to make sure we serve injured workers in this province that, through no fault of their own, find themselves dealing with the challenges yes, of hearing loss, Speaker, with the respect and the dignity they do deserve, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Minister of Labour. And I know the WSIB claims that there is an exemption process, but we've heard of cases where patients' requests are being unfairly delayed if approval comes at all. Moreover, the price cap on hearing aid devices, hearing devices, hearing aid devices remains the same. So the cost of the system is unchanged. Again, it begs the question, why was this change implemented in the first place? A hearing aid is not a one-size-fits-all. Choosing the right hearing aid is a choice for the patients and the hearing health care professionals. That decision should be left to them when there's no cost difference. Speaker, will the Minister of Labour commit to ensuring that WSIB reverses these flawed changes so that workers can choose the device that suits them best? Thank you. Speaker, once again, my thanks to the member for that close, uh, for that, uh, for the supplementary. Let me tell you, Speaker, after the discussion I've had with the WSIB, the WSIB is working very closely with the hearing aid manufacturers themselves, That's the Ontario news. Association very of Speech-Language Pathologists, with the audiologists, with the clinics across Ontario, Speaker. Working hard. They, um, the workers themselves, Speaker, deserve to be treated with dignity, respect, and Absolutely. have a smooth transition that goes along with it. I'm continuing to monitor the situation, um, continuing to ensure that injured workers are provided with the necessary resources, whether they have exceptional needs, complex needs, Speaker. We can deal with these. But I'll tell you, Speaker, to take lessons from this party on the treatment of injured workers oh. and the way Pick that they're the approaching curve. what we're trying to do, Speaker, about helping workers in Ontario, right. I would love to see him support increases to the minimum wage for the lowest income workers in the province of Ontario that face challenges on yes, a sir. daily basis, paying the rent, buying, buying clothes for their kids, Speaker. Ordinary expenses, too much too soon. Thank you. You see it, please. Your question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I want to tell you the story of Richard and Teresa Medor from Timmins. Richard, unfortunately, suffered a stroke some time ago, treated at the Timmins and District Hospital, doing their very best. What happens? The budget gets cut. They get rid of physiotherapy. So Richard loses his physiotherapy comes to go home. There's not enough services by CCAC to allow him to be able to live at home alone, so his wife has to quit her job in order to care for him because he can't be left alone for long, long periods of time. What makes matters even worse is he's 64 years old. He has no drug plan. He needs medication in order to deal with his medical condition. He gives me a call and he says, why is it Kathleen Wynne invented a drug plan that doesn't allow me, a person who's 64 years old, to get the medication that I need. So my question is to you, 
Why did you leave people like Richard Madour out of the out of the drug Question. plan, where clearly people who are 64 suffering from a stroke need to have their medication costs, just like the NDP proposed? Just to remind the member to the chair, please, and uh, that we use we use titles. We use titles and, and uh, writings names, please. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, you know, and obviously, uh, when any of us hear stories like this, we're moved uh, it's, um, and concerned. And it's important that all Ontarians uh, have the supports that they need uh, at that moment, uh, those moments, those times when they uh, truly need that support. Uh, we have a, a strong hospital system, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're increasing the budget this year of Timmins Hospital itself to help it uh, provide those highest quality services. Uh, our CCACs are going through transitions now by merging with our LINs so we can bring that care closer together and push the, the services to the front line where they truly do benefit patients. Uh, and when it comes to drugs, and I'm happy to talk about it uh, in the uh, supplementary, Mr. Speaker, uh, we make every effort uh, yes, to provide drugs uh, to those who do need them through a variety of programs, including Trillium, Ontario Works, ODSP, our seniors program. Thank you. We'll talk about that more in the, in the supplementary. Supplementary. Had a choice. Your government had a choice to be able to cover people like Richard, and you chose not to. Not that people under 24 don't, 24 don't need medication as well, but we know the vast majority of people that use medication are over 25 and under 65, and they're not covered. Yes, the Trillium drug plan is there, but they have to co-pay, and he has no pension. She had to quit her job in order to be able to stay with him, so they have hardly the income to even pay the co-pay. So my question again to you is very simply this. Why did you exclude people like Richard Medor, who's 64 years old, from being able to get access to the medication they need to have some quality of life as they go through their illness? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, it is true, Mr. Speaker. If you're if you're one of uh, the Ontarians who are lucky enough to be prescribed one of the three less than three percent of the drugs that are publicly available in this province. That's their proposal. So if you're lucky enough that the drug you've been prescribed by your health care provider, and God knows we would not want to limit the ability of physicians and nurse practitioners to prescribe what they believe is the best medication. If you're lucky enough to have one of those 125 out of more than 4,400 drugs, that's their proposal, but the vast majority of Ontarians would not fall into that category. And I know it irks the member and the party opposite when we have people like Steve Morgan, who stood up with, uh, with the leader of the third party when they proposed their pharmacare program, who said bravo about ours, and who sir? said that when the histories of pharmacare in Canada are written, this will be as, seen as a time when a clear principle was laid down by this government. Thank you. Your question, the member from the Thank you, West. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister, we always hear you talking about how Ontario economy is in a position of strength. We've been leading the G7 in growth for the past three years and have the lowest unemployment rate in 16 years. You're right, we're doing well today, and Ontario is incredibly competitive. This government has almost made efforts to cut red tape by removing 80,000 unnecessary regulation and hosting sector roundtables. But, Minister, there, th that's no guarantee we'll be doing well tomorrow. We're part of an aggressively competitive global economy. What is this government doing to ensure our business remain competitive and make Ontario the easiest place in North America to do business tomorrow? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. We've done a lot to make Ontario one of the easiest places in the world in which to do business. But there's still more that we can do, Mr. Speaker, and we're very ambitious in our, in our vision uh, to ensure that we continue to make Ontario the easiest place to do business in the new economy. And that's why the Minister of uh, Small Business and myself just last week announced eight new key reforms that are going to help us get there. The first is a measure to reduce uh, future regulatory administration costs. For every dollar twenty-five that we uh, in incur in a regulation, and it, it, it incurs an administration cost, 
uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they'll have to they'll have to save a dollar they'll have to save a dollar twenty five for any company that incurs that cost. Uh, we're taking measures as well to streamline compliance for small business, to align our regulations with other jurisdictions, uh, to, to recognize that the yes, businesses sir. have unique compliance initiatives. There's more, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be referring the supplementary to the Minister of Small Business, who will continue on with some of these Thank important you. initiatives. The supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My, so my sub, my sub. My next question is to the Minister of Small Business, and being uh, somebody that's been involved in small business all my life, this uh, minister is very, very important. Minister, it was recently reported that Canada big banks are forecasting that Ontario will lead the country in economic growth this year. We also know that Ontario has created almost 700,000 jobs since the depth of the recession. That is a recovery rate of some over 250%. Minister, these are promising figures. We want to make sure that Ontario continues down this path for prosperity. Would you please tell the legislator what initiatives are in place to help support this economic growth in Ontario? More specifically, what small business can expect in the coming months and years to come? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister responsible for small business, agriculture, and food. Minister, minister responsible for small business. And I want to uh, thank the uh, member from Northumberland Quinty West, who knows a lot about a small business. Mr. Speaker, I want to tell you that this year is the 50th anniversary of the Brighton Speedway, a business that has been owned by the Rodoli family for over 30 years. Oh. So I'm telling you, so Mr. Speaker, I'm telling you on a, sun, on a sunny Saturday night, the place to be is at Brighton Speedway because the member knows how important small businesses are to the province of Ontario. And just this past Monday. I had the opportunity to be at the gallery of supermarket when we announced that we're cutting fees by $2,000 per year for independent grocers in the province of Ontario on their beer and wine sales. That is a 66 per cent decrease in the cost of doing business in that particular sector of our economy. Answer. And we're doing a couple other things. We're looking at wage to increase government procurement for small businesses in the province of Ontario. And we're launching, Mr. Speaker, a one-stop access to support small business Thank you. Your question, the member from Morrison Halton Hills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. New regulations governing water-taking permits for water bottling companies were recently posted on the Environmental Registry. For years, I have maintained that any decisions regarding large-scale water-taking permit applications should be science-based to ensure that our groundwater is preserved and protected for future generations. I also believe that communities should be consulted and that their long-term growth plans should be taken into consideration and that hydrogeological studies should be peer-reviewed. Can the minister assure this House that his new regulations will ensure the long-term sustainability of our groundwater resources? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for a very thoughtful question. Uh, and from our ongoing conversations, I know he has a very sincere concern about this. He represents a part of the, pro the province which is water stressed, and that particularly uh, in the adjacent neighbourhoods of Kitchener, Waterloo and Cambridge, where we have groundwater being drawn off. And our concern with these regulations, Mr. Speaker, is the security of groundwater resources, which are particularly challenging, and where they are being drawn off and also used by municipalities and private water bottlers, these are areas that are most water stressed. And That's it's right. exactly for those reasons to protect the security of Ontarians' water supply to clean, reliable water that we are posting those. And through the posting period and the review and the science-based teams that are looking at this and our partnership with community leaders and municipalities, we will do exactly what the member is asking. Good stuff. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, each year an untold number of plastic water bottles are thrown away, ending up in landfills or littering our countryside. And I've said for years that the government needs to provide the necessary leadership and policies to encourage the recycling of more plastic water bottles. Most Canadian provinces have a deposit or refund program that covers plastic water bottles to encourage recycling. And I've been told that Manitoba will be launching a deposit system soon. The government recently raised the fees charged to water bottling companies by $500 for every million litres of water drawn. 
I maintain that some of that money should be shared with host municipalities and not just be a cash grab for the government. Will the minister commit to sharing some of that money with municipalities and also put some of it towards improved efforts to recycle all plastic water bottles in the province of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, again, I, I, I'm going to rush to qualifiedly agree with the member opposite, because I know he and his party supported Gov Bill 151, the Circular Economy Waste-Free Ontario Act. Um, and and ice, uh, ice Water Springs, for example, the GOTS, uh, have 100 per cent recycling recovery using extended producer responsibility, which is a economy-wide market mechanism that is working very well, uh, which your party supported, to do exactly that. We are open to a discussion about alternatives, as the member suggested, but we want, we want to make sure we're not creating a duplicate system, and we want to allow industry and environmental groups to work with the extended producer responsibility, of, of which the GOTS and Ice Water Springs, a company you're familiar with, yes, is, is a global leader right now in resource recovery. Should this not work, we will then have to work, uh, look at alternatives, but I think we Thank should you. first give a bill that was just passed months ago a chance. Thank you. New question. A member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, there is a province-wide crisis in student mental health that this government continues to ignore. Between 2012 and 2015, Algoma University had to increase its mental health counselling budget by 133 per cent, even as enrolment was declining. At Georgian College, there was a 211 per cent jump in the number of counselling appointments between 2013 and 16. At the University of Toronto, there was a 143 per cent increase in the number of students receiving mental health accommodations between 2009 and 2016. The additional $6 million this year for campus mental health to be shared by 24 colleges and 20 universities is a drop in the bucket compared to the explosion in the need. Speaker, instead of one-offs, when will this Liberal government implement Question. a comprehensive long-term strategy engaging both campuses and communities? to deal with this urgent crisis. Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education and Training. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for this question because it is a very important one. And I could tell you as I travel the province, as I meet with students, student groups, the number one issue that I hear about is, uh, is about mental health. There is no question that demand for mental health services is growing. And that's exactly why, Speaker, in this last budget, which the member opposite voted against, sadly, included a 60 per cent increase in funding for campus mental health support, six Speaker. Zero. That is a 6 zero incre percent increase because, Speaker, we need to be there. When students, uh, when students are faced with challenges, when they want some help with their mental health, we need to be there. I have to say that I did this announcement with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care at the University of Toronto, and it was extremely well received. Speaker. Answer. Extremely well received. Thank you, Speaker. This week, I met with both Colleges Ontario and Council of Ontario Universities, who told me that this government's lack of action is forcing colleges and universities to become mental health providers as well as educational institutions. Many of the 12,000 children and youth who are waiting in Ontario for mental health services are only able to access supports once they get to post-secondary. But without adequate resources on campus, many schools feel that they have no choice but to farm out support services to private contractors, something McMaster University psychi psychiatrist Dr. Catherine, Catherine Munn says will be a disaster for students. Speaker, we don't expect post-secondary institutions to treat physical illness. Why does this Liberal government expect them to treat mental illness? Well, Speaker, let me repeat. This budget contains a 60 per cent increase. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo is warned. Carry on. 
Six, uh, speaker, a 60 per cent increase in funding that is earmarked for campus mental health. But that is not the full extent of the investments that we're making, Speaker. Uh, we're expanding access to psychotherapy ser services while developing a new province-wide publicly funded psychotherapy program to help people, including students, living with conditions such as anxiety and depression. We're supporting up to nine integrated youth service hubs to provide young people with walk-in, one-stop access to mental health, which, as the member opposite knows, is, a, is in great demand because those students are using the services at Answer. the hub. This will be a youth-focused um, uh, service for mental, people with mental health and addictions, as well as other supports under one roof. Speaker. Thank you. And free prescription medications for people 25. New question. member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Every member of this House knows that our province is well into an unprecedented period of investment in infrastructure. We're building and repairing critical public infrastructure, such as schools, hospitals and public transit, because we're committed to making life better in Ontario. In my own riding of Kitchener Centre just last week, I announced $2.3 million to repair sewers and deliver clean water. And, Speaker, as I said at the time, sewers may not seem that glamorous, but they're essential to create creating a livable city. And we know that this multi-billion dollar infrastructure strategy is improving lives, not just in my riding, but in every riding in this province, including every single one represented by members of the opposition. Wow. Speaker, could the minister please Question. speak to how the benefits of these investments are being felt in communities right across Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member for the question. I have to start by uh, saying thank you to the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party. I'm sure they're aware that not one member of their caucuses has asked me a question on infrastructure in this place since I became Minister of Infrastructure over two full sessions, Speaker. Speaker, that must be because, Speaker, that must be because they think we're doing a terrific job on infrastructure in the province. Because it's hard to criticize a plan that will deliver at least $53 million in OSIF funding directly to municipalities in PC ridings in 2017, and a plan that has delivered a $474 million mental health facility in the opposition leader's riding, as well as over $8 million in OSIF and water infrastructure funding to communities in his riding. Speaker, our record Answer. speaks for itself. And the opposition's deafening silence on infrastructure is worth a thousand words. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his very informative answer. So, with these facts, and Speaker, facts do matter. Perhaps the Leader of the Opposition might stop giving speeches where he's claiming that we aren't getting shovels in the ground. Just come to my community of Kitchener Centre and you will see plenty of shovels in the ground. In the LRT project, the Shirley Avenue widening and the new GO train and GO bus storage facility. It's important for every member of this House and every constituent that we represent to have these facts. We're moving forward with our $190 billion infrastructure wow. investment plan. Our economy is responding, Speaker, to the steps that we're taking, making life easier and more affordable. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 16 years, and we've added 700,000 net new jobs since the height of the recession. So, Speaker, could the minister please share more facts on how he is helping to build Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'm glad to share some important facts about our infrastructure investments. Uh, so here's a fact for the leader of the third party. Our government has procured four major health care projects in Hamilton worth almost a billion dollars. All four use the AFP procurement model the NDP detests so much. And of those four, all were delivered on budget and all but one were delivered on time. Another fact. Hamilton is receiving $1 billion for its LRT and up to $33 million this year for water and wastewater infrastructure. And our current budget added $30 billion more for critical infrastructure. 
Both leaders opposite voted against enhanced quality of life for all Ontarians by opposing our budget. So, Mr. Speaker, the next time those two leaders go to the ballot box, they should take a good hard look in the mirror and then vote for Kathleen Wynne. And, sir, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Back in December of 2016, the Minister received a proposal from the Ontario Personal Support Workers Association requesting the right to become the provincial governing body of PSWs. The Minister would know there are many more PSWs in the health care system today than ever before. This means there's a greater need and role of our hardworking PSWs to match the increased need for home and community care. It also means there's a big need for proper oversight by a governing body to oversee the needs of PSWs and their clients. Mr. Speaker, the minister purports to be supportive of a health care system that protects all patients and health care providers. Therefore, can he tell this House when we can expect a response or action regarding this proposal? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the government investments in our personal support workers. And I have to say, I have the greatest respect for the thousands upon thousands of personal support workers who work so hard day and night, often on very short notice, Mr. Speaker. And when you talk to people who are receiving care from them, wherever that might be, it might be in a long-term care facility, it might be in their home. I think alongside nurses, the individual, the type of health care worker that is so most highly respected by, by individuals and the ones that they develop that strong, respectful, uh, challenging at times relationship with are our PSWs. So we've made investments where we've dramatically increased the minimum wage that uh, uh, in, here in Ontario, now it's $16.50, yes, Mr. Speaker, is the minimum. It reflects the talents that they bring, but we're doing much more with regards to our PSWs, and I'll talk about that Thank in you. supplementary. supplementary. Mr. Speaker, perhaps the minister should look at the people in the audience that are here from the PSWs. They were shaking their head no. I remind the minister that his government already failed just a year ago when they opened and closed the PSW registry, a failure that cost Ontarians over $5 million. <coughs> With an increasing aging population and our health care services being rationed, it's imperative that he takes action and gets this right. The OPSWA's proposal is comprehensive and outlines the importance of safety, accountability, legitimacy, trust, and oversight, things your government you claim your government upholds. Mr. Speaker, the minister's response acknowledges the important and expanding roles of our PSWs in our health care system, but will he now agree to give them their right to have a say on the future of their profession? Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we are continuing to work on the future of the PSW registry. It is true that I made the decision to close the previous registry in 2016 because I had respect for the profession and I wanted to make sure the registry was a powerful tool for individuals, for PSWs to gain employment, for employers to find employees, and for individuals that rely on PSWs to get that support. So we're working hard on that. We're, we've also created a curriculum, a standardized curriculum for PSWs. We've got a $10 million annual fund for training for PSWs who want to advance their training further, Mr. Speaker. We uh, contributed an additional $100 million uh, this year alone to enhance home care uh, clients, uh, the support to them, uh, home care clients. One point, that translates into $1.3 million Answer. more hours 1.3 million more hours of personal support care in home care. These are the kinds of investments that we're making to this important profession. Thank you. New question, the member from Kenora, Rainy River. To the Premier. Speaker, Josiah Begg, 14 years old, found dead in the McIntyre River in Thunder Bay on May 18th. Tammy Kiash, 17 years old, found dead in the McIntyre River less than two weeks earlier. Stacy DeBungie, 41, found dead in the river in 2015. Three more deaths to add to the seven unexplained deaths of young First Nations people in the river in the last decade. They're to pursue a public education and health care they can't get in their home communities. I named those seven students as well and called on this government to investigate what happened to them. A year ago, the coroner's inquest made a list of recommendations, including for this Liberal government. What has been done? <laughs> Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. 
Thank you very much, and uh, I thank the member opposite uh, for that question. And uh, uh, as I uh, said uh, to Grand Chief uh, Fiddler and uh, Chief Leonard uh, yesterday, on behalf of all of us, uh, our condolence to the loss of lives that's been taking place, and, and certainly. Um, as the minister responsible, we want to make sure, and I would say on this side of the house, we really uh, would like to uh, address the situation, and we are addressing the situation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are completely committed to working with our First Nation partners. We value the positive relationship we have with Indigenous community across our province, and at this point, the member fully knows that there's a component that, because of the ongoing reviews that are taking place, I am unable to answer some details. But I have full confidence, uh, as we know, on the OCPC, uh, the Ontario Civilian Police Answer. Commission, and the OC, uh, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, that will conduct Thank a you. throughout and a fair review. Supplementary. Uh, to clarify, my question is about action and what this Liberal government has done. In fact, the jury in the coroner's inquest recommended that all levels of government, including this Liberal government, acknowledge that without improvement of conditions in First Nations reserve communities, a gap in education outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students will remain. And where jurisdictional divisions between governments threaten to delay services, such as a quality of on-reserve education or funding for First Nations children, that the government of first contact should provide the services or funding without delay. So I ask again, without excuse, excuses, without pa passing the buck, what has this government done to act on the recommendations into the ongoing deaths in Thunder Bay? Uh, to the Minister of Indigenous uh, Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous you, Relations and Speaker, Reconciliation. Uh, the question is a, is, a, is a fair one. It's an important one. So much of uh, what happens to Indigenous youth here in Ontario, and particularly with respect to your question in northwestern Ontario, revolves around the issue of education. And education is a responsibility that the federal government and the provincial government share. We are looking, working with the federal government to facilitate ways in which those children who are sent from, for instance, the northern remote communities to the southern communities to complete their high school, that they can find that education in southern Ontario in a culturally environment and in a protected environment. Many of the youths that come from northern Ontario to the remotes, they're 13 or 14, yes, they find themselves in very difficult circumstances in Thunder Bay and the larger cities. We are working to provide a situation in Thunder Bay where they can achieve their education. My question the member from DGC Court. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Now, this week, I'm so delighted to say we all know that we passed legislation for the government's Fair Hydro Plan, which will lower electricity bills by 25 percent on average across the province. This change is going to result in significant and much lead needed relief for every household in Ontario, and I know that my constituents in Beaches East York are looking forward to their discounted hydro bills in the coming months. However, there are other elements of the government's plan that provide additional supports, particularly to communities who need it the most. Many low-income Ontarians are taking advantage of the Ontario Electricity Support Program, which provides an on-bill subsidy to those qualifying for the program, and I understand that the Fair Hydro Plan will be expanding on this program. So, Speaker, would the minister please provide a house Question. more details on how the OESP is being expanded for the benefit of low-income families and individuals across Mr. the province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question and, of course, for his hard work on this file for his constituents in Beaches East York as well. Mr. Speaker, unlike the opposition parties, our government has made support for vulnerable communities a central pillar of our plan. Um, the official opposition, well, they have no plan, Mr. Speaker, and the third party forgot to talk about vulnerable Ontarios in their energy plan, Mr. Speaker. We didn't. Mr. Speaker, we'll use existing funds through the Ontario Energy Board that they already have to expand the OESP program based on our direction, Mr. Speaker. 
The on-bill rebates offered to recipients have increased by 50 per cent, with the maximum credit now $900 a year, Mr. Speaker, and a special credit for those with unique electricity needs. They can see that credit, Mr. Speaker, up to $1,300. The expanded program yes, not only offers higher credits, but is also accessible to more people because we have increased eligibility for the program, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We heard, we acted, and we listened. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the incredible work that he is doing to make electricity affordable for all Ontarians. On this side of the House, we were so thrilled to see that bill pass, and I know that Ontarians are asking, because of the opposition on, on the other side of the House, what were they thinking? How could they be voting against lower people's electricity bills? The OEC program, however, provides important supports to low-income households in my community, and I'm proud that our government is demonstrating our commitment by helping these people in expanding the program. But expansion of the OESP is not the only social initiative which is being taken in the Fair Hydro Plan, because while all taxpayers in the province will receive the savings of 25 per cent on average, there are other programs which would support savings of upwards of 40 and 50 per cent, Speaker, for certain customers who qualify. Question. So, Speaker, would the minister please explain to this House what these other programs are and how they will help provide relief on electricity Thank you. costs? Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank uh, the member for uh, that follow-up. Speaker, uh, one of the other programs that uh, would be expanded under our Fair Hydro Plan is uh, one designed to lower uh, delivery rates, and that's called the Triple RP. This program provides a subsidy that lowers distribution costs for those in the most expensive to serve areas of our province. That's 800,000 families, Mr. Speaker, that will see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. But I can only assume that the opposition voted against that, Mr. Speaker, because that 40 to 50 percent reduction was too much, too soon, Mr. Speaker. Just like when you're talking about bringing forward a minimum wage that'll help families in this province, that's too much, too soon, Mr. Speaker. But what about uh, part-time workers to get paid uh, the same as full-time workers, Mr. Speaker? That's I know not. for the official opposition, too much, too soon, Mr. Speaker. 100,000 new childcare spaces. Thank you. Free tuition. Too much. Thank you. New question. The member from Simcoe Speaker, my question is uh, for the uh, Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by now the uh, minister would be well aware of the need for new hospitals uh, in my riding. I brought this issue to the uh, government's attention on a number of occasions. I've written letters. I've made statements. I've asked questions. I've collected thousands of petitions. The local uh, health integration networks in my riding have indicated that their top priority are the new hospitals in Collingwood and, and Alliston. Uh, to date, the government has been uh, very good to listen to our concerns, Mr. Speaker, but has never really indicated its support for the new hospitals in Alliston and Collingwood. So today's litmus test is to see if our hospitals really do have the government's support. So, Speaker, later this afternoon, all parties will debate my private member's resolution that calls on the government to approve the planning grants requested by both hospitals. So I asked the minister, will the government do exactly that and approve it? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm honoured to have the last word uh, before the summer break in question period, uh, and uh, especially on such an important subject. However, however, I do have to say it's slightly ironic because a party that has consistently told the government to spend less this is a question about investing in hospitals and spending more and ironic as well of course because we had nine billion dollars of new capital infrastructure in this year's budget that was just recently passed that that member and that party voted against notwithstanding that the collingwood and the stevenson hospitals are important hospitals to their communities and their important hospitals to this government. They have both submitted pre-capital submissions, which they've now moved on with the ministry's support and support to stage one. We continue to move forward, and I think it is positive that we continue to work collaboratively as we move through, as all hospitals in this province Thank do, you. the various processes and stages required. The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Kenny Burgess and Sabrina Kreiner, parents of students from Peninsula Shores District School have joined our students here. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.
Education. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I rise on a point of order. I'd like to welcome a group from my riding from the Settlement Assistant and Family Support Services, Kingston Road, who are here. There are seven, a group of 70 of them are here today with uh, Indira Basu. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> point of order, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, welcome and thank uh, one of our Page's uh, fathers, uh, Claire Ladone. Dino Ladone has had three Pages here oh, wow. um, at Queen's Park, and Claire is the youngest, so I'm sure this will be his last uh, visit. So, uh, welcome to Queen's Park, and thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you. Speaking of, oh, sorry, the member from Carlton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to introduce two people in the gallery as guests, Queenie Yu and Tanya Granicallum from Parents as First Educators. Thank you. Excuse me. Speaking of uh, speaking of introducing Pages and Pages' parents, um, I have some sad news. No. Please, uh, please, please allow me to uh, let you know that, uh, regrettably, this is the last day for our Pages. And I know you want to express your thanks to the wonderful work that they've done. Absolutely not. <laughs> I, uh, we do have business to do, though. Uh, we have a deferred vote on the, the government notice motion number 34 relating to allocation of time of Bill 134, an act to implement a 2017 budget. I call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. All members. May 31st, 2017, Mr. Sousa moved government notice of motion number 34 relating to allocation of time on Bill 134, an act to implement 2017 budget measures. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duca. Mr. Duca. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mrs. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one on time. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelis. Mr. Fidelis. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 52, the nays are 34. The ayes being 52, the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 89, an act to enact the Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2017 to amend and repeal the Child, Child and Family Services Act and make related amendments and other acts. Call on the members. This will be a five minute vote. May 31, 2017, Mr. Del Duca moved third reading of Bill 89, an act to enact the Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2017 to amend and repeal the Child and Family Services Act and to make related members amendments to other acts. All those in favour, please rise. One at a time be recognized. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Mackey. Mr. Mackey. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dodd. 
Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Ms. Renio. Ms. Renio. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Chibisson. Ms. Chibisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the court. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Yuri. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cove. Mr. Cove. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The eyes are 63, the nays are 23. The eyes being 63, the nays being 23, I declare the motion carried. Good reading the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. We resolve that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. Recognize the government house leader. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, her honor awaits.
Pray be seated. May it please your honor. The province has, at its present meetings, thereof passed certain bills to which, in the name and on behalf of the said Legislative Assembly, I respectfully request your honor's assent. The following are the title of the bills to which your honor's assent is prayed. An act to enact the Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2017, to amend and repeal the Child and Family Services Act, and to make related amendments to other acts. Loi édictant la loi de 2017 sur les services à l'enfance, à la jeunesse et à la famille, modifiant et abrogeant la loi sur les services à l'enfance et à la famille, et apportant des modifications connexes à d'autres lois. An act to provide for anti-racism measures. Loi prévoyant des mesures contre le racisme. An act to enact the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan Act 2017 and to make amendments to the Electricity Act 1998 and the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Loi dictant la loi de 2017 sur le plan ontarien pour des frais d'électricité équitable et modifiant la loi de 1998 sur l'électricité et la loi de 1998 sur la Commission de l'énergie de l'Ontario. An act to revive 2053266 Ontario Inc. An act to revive Prosper Legal Management Inc. An act to revive 1049491 Ontario Inc. An act to revive 564539 Ontario Limited. An act to revive 1476283 Ontario Limited. An act to revive Brasery Chicken Limited. An act to revive Roy Wilson Real Estate Inc. An act respecting the East York Foundation. An act to revive Sierra Cleaning Solutions Inc. An act to revive St. Pola Drugs Inc. An act to revive SKAS Auto Services Inc. An act to revive Millar Wager Holdings Inc. In Her Majesty's name, Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor doth assent to these bills. Au nom de Sa Majesté, son honneur, la lieutenant gouvernante sanctionne ces projets de loi. I just wanted you to sit down. <laughs> uh, pray, pray allow me one comment. Uh, be safe, enjoy your family, enjoy the break, although the break is not just from here. You work hard. You work very hard on, the on behalf of the people of Ontario. And I, know, and I know you deserve credit for all the work that you do for those people that you represent. And I thank you for that honour of allowing me to be your speaker. Therefore, there are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.